Do you know that only two of the ten main cloud types, Nimbus Stratus and Cumulonimbus, are able to produce significant amount of precipitation? Why is that? Why is it so hard for clouds to make precipitation? Well, the whole story is a typical size of cloud condensation nuclei is about 0.2 micrometer, while a cloud droplet is about 20 micro micrometer, and a raindrop about 2000 micrometers. Cooling moist air to the dew point and raising the relative humidity to 100% makes the water condense instantaneously on a cloud condensation nuclei to form a cloud droplet. It will take much longer, a day or more, for condensation to turn in a cloud droplet in a raindrop. You must know from personal experience that once a cloud forms, you don't have to wait that long for precipitation to begin to fall. Part of the problem is that it takes quite a few 220 micrometer diameter cloud droplets to make one 2000 micrometer diameter raindrop. How many exactly? The raindrop is 100 times wider, 100 times bigger from front to back, and 100 times taller than the cloud droplets. That the raindrop has a volume that is 100 times 100 times 100, it's equal 1 million times larger than the volume of the cloud droplets. It takes about a million cloud droplets to make one average size raindrop. Fortunately, there are two processes capable of quickly turning small cloud droplets in a much larger precipitation particles in a cloud. The collision coalescence process works in clouds that are composed of water droplets only, they call warm clouds. So those clouds are only found in the tropics. You see that's a pretty easy process to understand. This process will only produce rain drizzle and something called verga, rain that evaporates before reaching the ground. The ice crystal process produces precipitation everywhere else, also called the Bergeron process. This process that makes rain in Atlanta, even in the hot day in the summer. Summer thunderstorm clouds are tall and reach into cold parts of the atmosphere well below freezing. Hey, you and Grapple often fall from those storms, proof that the precipitation starts out as an ice particle. There is one part of this process that's a little hard to understand. So let's see, this process also can produce a variety of different kinds of precipitation particles. Rain, snow, hail, sleet, grapple, etc. So here's how coalescence, collision coalescence process works inside a warm cloud with just water droplets. The collision coalescence works because the cloud is filled with cloud droplets of different size. The larger droplets fall faster than the small droplets. A larger than average cloud droplet will overtake and collide with smaller, slow moving ones. This is an accelerating growth process. The falling droplets get wider, falls faster, and sweeps out an increasingly large volume, volume inside of the cloud. The bigger the droplet gets, the faster it starts to grow. Think of a growing ball of snow that is rolled down at snow cover hill and picks up snow, grows and starts rolling faster and faster. Or think of an avalanche that gets bigger and moves faster as it travels down slope. You got the picture. A larger than average cloud droplet can very quickly grow to rain drop size. Remember, again, there are two precipitation type of clouds, Nimbus stratus and Cumulonimbus. Nimbus stratus clouds are thinner and have a weaker updraft than Cumulonimbus. The largest raindrops fall from Cumulonimbus clouds because the droplets spend more time in the cloud growing. In a Cumulonimbus cloud, raindrops can grow while being carried upward by the updraft and also when falling downdraft. So, in the cold clouds, we have several types of precipitation, but pretty much what happens is it forms snow. Snowflakes are simple aggregates of ice crystals that collect to each other as they fall towards the surface. The size and shape of the snowflakes are quite varied, 
depend upon the atmospheric conditions and under which they form. As long as the temperature of the atmosphere below the cloud level is below freezing, snow will fall to the ground. However, the temperature can be above freezing for part of the path as a falling snowflake and the snow can still be observed at the ground as long as it doesn't melt on the way down. Another type of precipitation called clouds is called freezing rain. When you hear news of ice storm, it is freezing rain. Ice storms can be the most devastating of winter weather phenomena and are often the cause of automobile accidents, power out aids and personal injuries. Ice storms result from the accumulation of freezing rain, which is a rain that becomes super cold and freezes upon impact with cold surface. So freezing rain develops as a falling snow, as we mentioned before, and encounters a layer of warm air deep enough for the snow to completely melt and become rain. As the rain continues to fall, it passes through a thin layer of cold air just above the surface and cools to a temperature below freezing. Or, however, the drops themselves do not freeze. When the supercool drops strike the frozen ground, or power lines, tree branches, etc., they instantly freeze, forming a thin film of ice, hence freezing rain. A prolonged period of freezing rain results in a thick layer of ice covering everything. An intense ice storm can paralyze a region in a matter of hours, greatly affecting the people who live there. Freezing rain is dangerous because it's almost invisible or a smooth surface, and consequent, consequently, people are often unaware of this presence. Sidewalks and roadways become extremely slick and car, car acid accidents are common during an ice storm. Tree limbs and power lines weighed down by accumulating ice can snap. So another one is called sleet. Sleet is less prevalent than freezing rain and is defined as a frozen raindrops that bounce on impact of the ground or other objects. The difference here is that melted or partially melted snowflakes fall through a much deeper layer of below freezing air near to the ground, and freezing in little balls of ice before hitting the ground. Sleet is more difficult to forecast than freezing rain because it develops under more specialized atmospheric conditions. It's much less troublesome than freezing rain because it's easy to see and is already frozen before hitting the ground. Another one precipitation happen is hail. Hail is a form of precipitation that occurs when updrafts in thunderstorms carry raindrops upward into extremely cold areas of the atmosphere where they freeze into balls of ice. Hail can damage air aircraft, homes and cars, and it can be deadly to livestock and people. So how the hail forms? So hail stones grow by colliding with supercool water droplets. Supercool water will freeze in contact of ice crystals, frozen raindrops, dust or some other nuclei. Thunderstorms that have a strong updraft keep lifting the hail stones up to the top of the cloud, where they encounter more supercool water and continue to grow. The hail falls when the thunderstorm's updraft cannot longer support the weight of the ice or the updraft is weakens. The stronger the updraft, the larger the hailstone can grow. So hailstones can have a layers like an onions if they travel up and down in the updraft, or they can have a few or no layers if they are balanced in the updraft. One can tell how many times a hailstone travels on the top of the storm by counting the layers. Hailstones can bring them out and then refreeze together, forming large and very irregularly shaped hail. So how they fall on the ground? So hail falls when it becomes heavy enough to overcome the strain of the updraft and is pulled by gravity towards the earth. How it falls depends on what is going on inside the thunderstorm. Hailstones bump into it in other raindrops and other hailstones inside the thunderstorm. And this bumping slow 
down their fall. Drag and friction also slow their fall, so it is a complicated question. If the winds are strong enough, they can even blow hail so that it falls at an angle. This would explain why these screens on one side of the house can be shredded by hail and the rest are unharmed. So, in reality, we estimate about the speed of the rainfall. This is really hard. One estimate is that one centimeter hailstone falls at 9 meters per second, and an 8 centimeter stone weighing 0.7 kilograms falls at 48 meters per second. We talk about 171 kilometers per hour. However, the hailstone is not likely to reach terminal velocity due to the friction, collisions with other hailstones or raindrops, wind, the viscosity of the wind, and melting. Also, the form is a little more complicated than the expair because they are not perfect sphere. So, which areas you have the most hail? True Florida has the most thunderstorms. Nebraska, Colorado, and Wyoming usually have the most hailstorms. The area where these three states meet, Hail Alley, averages 7 to 9 hail day per year. The reasons why this area gets so much hail is that the freezing level, the area of the atmosphere at 32 degrees or less, is that the height plains are much closer to the ground than they are at sea level, where hail has plenty of time to melt before reaching the ground. Other parts of the world that have damaged rainstorms include China, Ru Russia, India, and Northern Italy. When viewed from the air, it is evident the hail falls in path known as hail swath. They can range in size from a few acres to an area of 10 miles wide and 100 miles long. Piles of hail and hail swath has been so deep as a snow plot was required to remove them and occasionally hail drifts has been reported. How large they can be at? Wow, hail is usually pea size to marble size, but big thunderstorms can produce big hail. The largest hailstorm recovery in the US fell in Vivian, South Dakota in June 23, 2010, with a diameter of 8 inches and a circumference of 18.62 inches, and weighed 1 pound and 15 ounces.